my brother and I farm uh, northwest of Mitchell, South Dakota. We've been partners since uh, the early 80s. We raise soybeans and corn and some wheat. We were alarmed at the rate that organic matter has been decreasing since they broke the native sod. Once you realize that 50% of the organic matter has disappeared in literally 100 years, and we know that organic matter, without it, you raise no crop. So really that kind of got us interested, knowing that it was imperative to start increasing organic matter levels in the soil. We can't continue on the same path. We have to start focusing a lot more on soil health. And soil health, you know, isn't just one thing. It's like a system approach. I mean, for us, it's combining no-till, crop rotation, cover crops, and then planting like native grass species in our sensitive areas, in our wetlands, and our salinity areas, and along our watersheds, to try to make our land not only profitable, but sustainable for the future, and uh, to be able to tell the consumer we're out here producing a crop in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way. I think one of the big benefits that people don't think about is, uh, I mean, it is water management. Uh, you know, in our part of the world, let's say you have a corn crop and uh, it quits using water pretty much about October 1st. And then you plant soybeans, you know, in the middle of May and they really don't use very much moisture until almost the end of June. And that's one of the downfalls of our crops is we, don't, we have a lot of moisture in the spring and our crops don't use a lot, so we have to find a way to store that moisture and cover crops are an excellent way to do that. We made a real push to involve our landowners on the land that we rent and lease to get involved and to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and show them that ultimately they probably benefit more than anyone does. One of the things that we've done in terms of uh, educating our landowners is in the water quality area. We are upstream from Lake Mitchell and we have a one mile of Fire Steel Creek running through our property. And 10 years ago, uh, we worked in conjunction with the NRCS, the Game Fish and Parks, Jim River Development Corporation, and actually the city of Mitchell to uh, establish a mile long 350 acre riparian buffer to help keep runoff from going into the fire steel and ultimately ended up in the lake. And it just kind of ties into the whole package that we put together in terms of soil health, water quality, even coming down to the bee pollinators, we're in the bee program. And so, you know, we just want to educate non-farmers on what we're doing to make you know, the soil as well as the water and keep the bees alive uh, and, the, and the things that we do that are kind of going the extra mile. Working with these guys is kind of the same process I do with all my other landowners. Um, we spend a lot of time with the conservation planning process which has nine steps of planning. We're trying to identify resource concerns and identify different conservation practices that will benefit their land and operation and the resources on the land. It's eye-opening to, to see someone that committed for this long period of time to make no-till successful in this area and to try to better themselves with just not only no-till, but to interject the, the, the various crop rotations and the cover crops into the cropping systems. You know, the fun part of it is there's so many passionate people involved with it, with the NRCS, with the SDSU Extension, with Dakota Lakes Research Farm, and the Soil Health Coalition. There's all kinds of support, and it's just nice, you know, talking with these other people who have the same passion as you that can help you. I mean, it's just been really fun you know, and this isn't all just about profitability, it's doing what's the right thing for the future. Hi, I'm Craig Staley from Mitchell. Uh, we've had some excellent speakers so far, and I think Chris said something about 
You know, by the time you go home at night, you feel even dumber you did in the morning. But I think I peaked. Like I don't think I could feel any any stupider on some stuff right now after after you ponder all the things that we've heard about that kind of really make you think different about what we need to do in the future. Um, I have a little of history on my farm. I farm with my brother Gene around the Mitchell area. We first started trying to no-till back in 1986. Uh, we just started putting a little corn and into oat stubble and and barley stubble and really just did that and we're still working the rest of our ground. And then back in 1989, which was a dry year, we just happened to decide to go up. We knew there was a research farm and that Dwayne Beck was operating up in the Redfield area. And I just remember driving up there, I think it was maybe at the end of July. And the whole way up there, we just went by burned up after burned up, poor looking crops. And we get up to Dwayne's research farm. And it's like a little oasis in the in in the area and saw what he was doing and he uh, really helped us get started where we wanted to go 100% no-till so went back home ordered a 750 drill and then ever since I've been trying to no-till everything um, so when we first started we were um, we did a pretty a decent job with uh, diversity we were planting winter wheat spring wheat and corn and soybeans but we didn't really do a very good job of intensifying our water use, so um, we we're, you know, we were just planting the winter wheat and then doing nothing except spraying it till spring, and we really struggled, obviously, uh, getting crops planted in the spring because uh, the wheat would stop using moisture in July, and you try to put corn back in there next May, and you know we probably get a lot of years get 15 inches of precept, and the soil holds eight, nine, so you got six inches of water that's either gonna run off or, or, or pond on your field. So at, uh, in the late 1980s, I started trying to find some different cover crop mixes to work with and worked with Jason Miller. And we first started off, we were trying to use the different clovers, thinking that we could fix some nitrogen, you know, the red clovers, um, crimson and sweet clover. If we could get them in there, we could maybe fix them in and use some water, but they really didn't, uh, they weren't aggressive enough. You know, you just didn't get enough, unless you wanted to wait till June 15th to plant your corn, they just really don't use enough fall moisture. So uh, just kept trying different stuff and finally ended up just like everybody else, kind of moving to some different mixtures. Um, obviously we've talked a lot about the benefits of cover crops, you know, if, uh, they help increase diversity, but I think the one thing that, especially in eastern South Dakota, we have to talk about is increasing intensity. Uh, if you think what, like our grandfathers used to do, they planted oats, the crop that used springtime moisture, and then they, they put sweet clover with it, and then let the sweet clover grow up, so in the next spring, they were using a lot of moisture in the spring too, and then the only mistake they made was they plowed it, but at least they had their water intensity a lot better than we do. I mean, we're going out, you plant, you know, corn and beans, they don't use enough, don't use enough moisture in the spring, and, and pretty soon you have all these salinity areas in this runoff, so, I mean, that's one of the main benefits of cover crops is trying to increase our water usage. You take the tillage out, you have to do something to increase your water water usage to try to make it more like the native prairie. And so that's one of the things I've been doing with cover crops. And the other things, obviously you're building carbon and organic matter, reduce nutrient leaching. As you can see by Anthony's slides, slides that, uh, I mean, a lot of these pHs have dropped from seven down to, the low, to mid to low fives, and that's just because you know, it's leaching nutrients because we're not using enough water. And so some of the other advantages, obviously, is to manage the soil moisture. Um, fixed nitrogen, which, you know, that's when I first started out, I was one, trying to do, but really, you just really don't, if you're putting it in behind wheat or putting it in behind corn or soybeans, you just really don't, you have to almost have a full season cover crop if you're gonna, if 
fixing the end. So it mostly comes down to uh, managing soil moisture, having a, providing a living root system to improve your soil health, uh, changing the plant residue to darker residue so you get better warm up in the spring, and build organic matter and carbon. And some of the things obviously I've looked for, everybody does, since you're not normally going to harvest the cover crop, is you try to start with low seed costs, something that's easily to establish, uh, easy to get planted, and uh, has aggressive growth. So you can, in our short, you know, we just don't have a long enough season that we got to have something that have aggressive growth. This picture is like cereal rye that I broadcast into into standing corn about oh, the 10th of September and this picture is like uh, the middle of April. So you can see you can get some really intense growth. growth. And the other thing you gotta really be careful of with some of the cover crops is make sure you're thinking about what herbicides you're using before, uh, before you plant the cover crop. Like in my wheat, I, I usually pretty much just use a a herbicide with no residuals so you don't have to worry about affecting your cover crop mix. And you know I've used a lot of different equipment. Uh, I pretty much plant all my mixes behind wheat with my drill and I have tried planting a few with a planter just to get a few get over a few more acres and then I also broadcast like uh, my cereal rye into stalks, corn stalks. And these are some of the ones I've tried. I've tried the, and all this was broadcast. I tried broadcasting the winter wheat, annual ryegrass, and oilseed radish into standing corn, and also the cereal rye. And I pretty much just gone to using the cereal rye because it has some. It's so aggressive that you can get so much growth off of it. And um, I've done it like four years in a row. I just kind of, usually about the first or second week in September when the Corn is starting to let a little more light, drop its leaves and it's starting to let more light in there. I'll just watch the weather forecast and if it looks like the temperatures are going down, there's a chance for precip. I just have them aerial apply somewhere around, you know, anywhere from 55 to 60 pounds depending on the seed count. And so I just take the rye up and I've I've done it like four years in a row and I've always gotten a pretty good stand. I mean, I suppose if we have a real dry fall, um, it, you might not, but so far I, it's worked every year. And the thing that I, that's nice about broadcasting is you can get it done so much uh, earlier than you can if you got a combine it. So, I mean, this is all planted in, in the first couple of weeks of September. And, and also, you know, when you drill it, instead of broadcasting, you, you lose quite a few leaves off your corn stalks because over winter, you go over it with the drill, and you'll lo lo lose quite a bit of residue. And I still do dr drill some, I just do some of each, so, I, so I'm not taking a chance too much on either one. And the one thing about the rye, rye is so winter hardy that, I mean, I, drill it, I drilled it this year on Thanksgiving Day, so. And it, it always seems like it never winter kills. And then in the spring, I just come back and I, I usually like to get quite a bit of growth on it. Now, if I was gonna uh, err on one side, I'd let it you know, get bigger than I wanted to because I'm just trying to help with soil moisture management and try to reduce, keep from getting these more salinity spots. So I'll let it get, up to boot, boot high, about you know three, four feet, and then uh, kill it, and then plant plant soybeans into it. Uh, the one thing you got to make sure you, you want to either kill it like six, seven days ahead, or wait till after you plant it, because you don't want to kill it like two, three days before you plant, because then it gets real rubbery and can really affect your seed to soil contact and cause you trouble. And um, like when I, I spray it out, I make sure that I don't use any burners. Uh, you know, if you're gonna mix a pre in there, I use like dual pursuit, but really there, if you have a good stand, you get 
such a mad residue, it holds weeds down so good that you probably won't have to use a pre. On some fields I do, some I don't, but it really helps with weed control. And the other thing you gotta check on is, like if you're gonna plant into green crops, I mean, there's some rules on crop insurance, so, I mean, that's, you don't want, that's one issue too with planting a green that nobody talks about, but you probably wanna check with your crop insurance and see what they say about it. And I've done it like, done it on even some dry years, and I've never seen the soybeans yield less. Like this year where I had rye, having all that rain and, you know, we had a tremendous amount of rain in uh, end of June, and they were probably four or five bushel better than where I didn't have rye, because they just took that moisture a lot better. And this is the thing I really like about it. With soybeans, we just really not, you know, putting any carbon back in the soil, and this is after I harvest the beans, and there's just so much rye residue out there, it looks more like wheat stubble. And you know, might take, might not see a huge advantage in two years, but you keep doing that over, over 10 years or 20 years, it's gonna make a very big difference. I mean, that's the thing about these cover crops. You might not see a benefit next year. Like a lot of times in our area, you know, where I put cover crops behind wheat, uh, if we have a fairly decent moisture in the next spring, I mean, it doesn't necessarily out yield my corn on soybean grounds, but usually the second year when I put beans back in there, a lot of times they're four or five bushel better. So it, sometimes it takes a couple years where you see the benefit. And these are some different cover crops I've tried into wheat stubble and some successful, some not. But I pretty much end up where you see where most people are on using a mix. And obviously the first mix I think that everybody tried it, that actually worked was the, you know, the radish canola lentil mix. And this, uh, this mix worked pretty good because it has a lot of uh, aggressive growth. But I mean, the one thing it's lacking is, is you know, not enough carbon. It's just all broad leaves. And, what I notice too is when you plant this, you always get a huge flush of volunteer wheat. So you have to deal with that and a lot of times spray it out. So then I started going with more of a mix that I have now, which is, has like 15 pounds of oats or 15 pounds of oats and barley. And it, you know that oats just comes flying out of the ground and seems like it really suppresses the volunteer winter wheat. And, uh, and then I also have um, rapeseed, radish, uh, Ethiopian cabbage, flax, and sunflower in that mix. So each of them has different benefits. You know, the flax and the Ethiopian cabbage, they'll stand really good over winter if you want to catch some snow. And, but I definitely try it. You don't want to put too much. You don't want to get too much oats or bar, too high a percentage of the grass crops in there. I think I'm planting like maybe 10 and 15 pounds of oats and barley. And this is one other thing I've tried behind the wheat. This is like uh, medium red clover. I um, frost seeded in like March. And, and into my wheat and then I let it grow all season and then put corn back in there and then I just had a little spot so I just left it in, in a food plot area to see how long it'd live and it, it, about two, three, I got like three years out of that clover and then it, it, the frost killed it. But uh, the only downside to this is first it has to be dry enough in March, you know, before you get it seeded and then you have to be awfully careful with the what you use for herbicide, because I think the only thing you could use is like buck drill that won't kill that clover. Either that or don't use one, but probably the one good thing about it is it's growing all season, so it should fix them in for you. And the other thing I've tried where I didn't think I was gonna get everything planted with my uh, planter, I went and put uh, grain sorghum discs in my planter and I planted, uh, this is chickling vetch and field peas. 
So if you, you know, if you don't have a drill, that's one option. The only problem is it really pretty low on carbon, so it's certainly not near as good as the other mixes. But it's, you know, it's something you could do if you have no access to a drill. And the other thing I tried this year, I just keep trying different stuff to try to come up with, you know, more diversity and more water intense use is, uh, you've seen a lot of research on this uh, skip row corn. So I'm in 22 inch rows, so I planted two, two rows and then I'd leave a row blank. And all I did was I just, I kept my population total per acre, I just usually plant around 28,000, so I just upped the rate in those two other rows to mimic, I think I was up to like 37,000 in those two rows. And then at like V6, I, uh, I side dressed urea and then I put a mixture of uh, red clover, crimson clover, uh, radish, and annual ryegrass. And I was lucky enough to get a rain and uh, I had pretty good growth, but even, I even still had some trouble with shading because this year the corn grew so fast, even though there's a 44 inch space. I mean, the cover crop didn't get real big, but I still think it's gonna do me quite a bit. Of, you know, you don't know the root growth underground means just as much as what's above ground. So I'm hoping it did quite a bit of good. And, and the other thing I like about this is now I'll just go over where that 44 inch gap is, I'm gonna plant corn there again. And then this fall, I'm gonna put cereal rye in there and go back to soybeans. So in three years, I'll have two years of corn, two years of cover crop, and one year of soybean, which will be a lot better for building carbon and, and uh, uh, using extra soil, you know, increasing intensity on soil moisture than corn soybeans. I mean, that's real the, really the downside of, of doing that corn soybeans. So, I mean, for parts of eastern South Dakota, I think this could really work good. But the only, only thing you got to make sure of is you have to get a written agreement with crop insurance in order to do skip row planting. So, you have to get them to sign off on it before I do very much. And as you can see, I have some salinity areas too, and this is just from over the years, you know, not having an intense enough uh, water usage. So, I mean, instead of fighting it, I mean, I just put a lot of this area that had the low ground or had salinity issues into, into CRP. Um, and you can just see, right, the only problem I made here is I didn't go out far enough. But you can see that's like three years of growth, how much of that uh, grew in that saline area. And that's like that uh, salt lander, wheatgrass, and alfalfa. And it was really amazing how fast that turned that around and how fast that filled in. I mean, even first the wheatgrass comes and lowers that salt, you know, the salinity a little bit, and then pretty soon you see alfalfa growing. And so, but if you just go back to farm and keep doing the same thing, it's just gonna go back to the way it was. So I, uh, a lot of my fields, I probably farm like 80% of it and have CRP spots in the, in the low areas. Just, I mean, there's a lot of them, you just, they just drowned out and you know, you're not, you're losing more money on them than, than, than even if you didn't, you know, you'd better off just not, paying rent on them or have the land costs instead of keep farming them. I think that's one, one thing you're gonna see people do in the future. Even if, even if you can't get it to CRP, you just will put it to permanent vegetation and, uh, and bale it or instead of, you know, if your land costs are $150, but you, you know, you're still probably losing 250 by farming it. So you just better bite the bullet and lose 150 and improve the soil health of the rest of the field. And this is a picture, this is like Canadian wild rye. And this is another area that was, had a lot of salinity. And that's like two years after I planted it. So, 
I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do with these areas besides just keep driving over them and putting seed and fertility on them. So in conclusion, I guess some of the things would be to plant aggressive mixtures, uh, plant the cover crop like it's a cash crop, you know, just don't take the time to plant it right and keep trying different mixtures. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Kurt Stiefvater. I live over at Salem and farm over there. I get to go out and speak here once in a while. Um, just going to talk a little bit about my farm history and some of the changes I've done over the years and kind of where it's progressed to. Um, here's a, from the previous owners of our homestead, I guess, or the where we didn't homestead, but where we own now is a 1948 photo of our farm that they gave us from when their parents passed away and passed it on. They thought it'd be kind of cool. I didn't realize they'd take aerial shots back that long ago. Um, but I'm fourth generation. Uh, parents bought this farm in 1959 and uh, we've Got cow-calf pairs and raised cattle and hogs over the years. Uh, used a lot of barley previously. And this is what it looks like now. Lots of changes. The barn and where the new house is now is where the old house was. That's about all that's left anymore. Uh, May of 2011, I had a 120 mile an hour windstorm come through and that's why stuff got updated here a little sooner than my long term plan but the grain bins mostly to the right and the big new shed there was other sheds and I had two silos there that were taken down in the wind so I got a instant farm upgrade. Um, just as we keep analyzing things as we go along in our lives, uh, back in 98 when the hogs got so cheap and stuff, I decided to get out of that venture and concentrate more on the hogs and the crop part of our farming operation. Uh, farmed with my mom and dad um, up till the, they decided to move to town in 1995, so I took over the farm more full time, I guess, then. But uh, currently, we're raising oats and corn and soybeans. Uh, got some alfalfa. For the first time last fall that I know of, the farm has winter wheat on it. Gonna experiment with that a little bit. Um, got the cow calves, too complement uh, some of the cover crops and stuff that I'm using. Um, doing a three-year rotation basically working in the corn and soybeans. Follow the oats with a cover crop right now. I like to work in and get some uh, crops in with the soybeans and the corn. Get that worked in there like Staley's are using. I think that's a real good way to do that. Um, back in 1998, uh, Dad and I were talking. We got to do something a little different. We got to seem like our crops had plateaued a little bit. The yields, so we uh, got a white planter and went to 19-inch rows on soybeans, and we liked that good enough. Um, went to 19 inch corn and about that same time we started no-tilling. We, there's a lot of ups and downs and it was early on for this area and the amount of rainfall we had and don't understand the soil like I do now but uh, there's a lot of 10 years worth of failures I would say. Um, mudding the crop in, uh, not knowing how to manage that extra moisture that we had with the no-till. So we, and working with the soil biology that I know now, 
uh, to break down that residue and use it better. Um, reason now I'm on 22 inch rows, we went to that just to have some more common equipment uh, as we upgraded equipment as it wore out. Um, didn't see a lot of advantage at first of the yield, but it's uh, coming along now uh, as we understand how to utilize it more. Um, about 25 years of no-till on just about all my ground. Um, I do put uh, fertilizer in furrow, just a low rate there to help get it going in the spring. Um, last couple years I've been, people think it's always so much colder for no-till. I've been temping my soils going from field to field between the corn stalks, uh, cover crops, bare soybean fields. I can test them all within an hour and they'll be all within a one degree uh, soil temperature. So I, whatever reason, I don't think that's an issue anymore. I used to think it was a hold up, but doesn't seem to be. This is, uh, as you can see, there's an awful lot of residue there and uh, makes for tight quarters. They call me the anti-pheasant hunter guy around because of my narrow rows. So. When I uh, fertilize my oats, I put about 35-40% uh, of the fertilizer for the year down dry before I plant. And then I'll put the rest on here later and I use the stream bar to stream the nitrogen on. Uh, just about at boot stage. Here's some homemade wide drops I did for side dressing my corn. Uh, got to realizing I was doing it too early. So was, these little short ones are probably only two and a half feet long. So it wasn't quite accomplishing what I needed to, I didn't think, to get it on a little later. Now I've gone to these that mount on the bar. Uh, they're not homemade, but they're substantially cheaper than some name brand, I guess. Um, after getting in the oats there, uh, about seven years ago, I really started using the three-way rotation and stuff. That's uh, changed the, figure out a different way to utilize our feed also. Um, for the cows during the winter. I just felt like I was taking too much time, either used to chop silage and putting up hay, extra equipment, um, do most of this work myself, except for some summer help high school kids. Uh, I just didn't have the fall help either to get some of that put up. So I uh, started looking, get a cover crop in there, utilize that all winter long. Um, I figure I probably cut my hay usage down 40 or 50 percent or better to, during the winter. Uh, last year was exceptional. I had good growth on my cover crops. I didn't uh, feed any of my cows till the second week of March. They didn't, they put a hay in the hay feeder and they would take a bite and go spend the day in the cover crops. So as you can see, we get pretty good growth there. Um, these are planted like mid, late August when I get the oats off. I drill them in with a, um, just a 5400 International uh, drill. So it's nothing too special. One thing I'll go back with on my corn planter, uh, the last two years I have bought a wheat disc for my corn planter and I've been putting some oats in with my corn planter. Uh, I'll make a pass and then I'll turn around and just offset 11 inches and come back so I'm on 11 inch spacing for my oats. Um, the yield seems there is good, I just gotta keep cutting the seed rate. Um, shooting for about a million and a quarter seeds originally an acre 
and I was down under a million and I still think that's too thick for the good stand I get with the, with the corn planter. Using that, the straw shortens up about oh, probably two to three inches shorter straw, but the yield is still the same. So I don't know, I gotta keep playing with that if I'm gonna keep doing that. Biggest problem I have is creating compaction, I guess, coming right back on top of those other rows when you're in the spring when it's a little wetter. So that's the part, biggest part I don't like. Here's a little bit of some of the mixes I've tried. Uh, probably seven or eight different uh, varieties for a mixture. I um, think you get too many. One chokes the other out, I think, a little bit for me. Some peas growing in there. Here you can see how much residue is there yet um, going in there. I just really like that to keep for the water retention, protecting the soil from heavy rains and or any rains as far as that goes, and then uh, wind erosion. Uh, it says saying I got cow calf operation, got about uh, 140 cows. I probably put about on average a good 500 acres of oats in a year or some kind of small grain. Um, I also move my calving till the middle of May. I don't, my cows don't start till middle of May calving. And I'll uh, get them all calved out in the pasture, start calving them out, get 20, 30 pair, and then I haul them out to pasture. They they pretty much take care of themselves calving. I last 10 years I probably maybe helped six or eight calves or pulled six or eight calves. I'm using a touch smaller bull, but it's not that isn't the problem. I think uh, that green grass that the cow has it slicks up her slicks her up inside to help her calve easier with that little bit of extra green grass. Uh, it's, this is one after they chewed it off in the fall, I guess, and I moved them on. So you can still see there's an awful lot of residue and protection yet there for the soil. And look how it stays green too, uh, right up till it's covered with snow deep. And like I said, if there's sunshine, it'll keep going all winter long yet. Um, this was a little oops that I found out, but my cover crop from the previous year grew enough and it matured out in the fall, the seed was good, and came back to combine corn the next year in it and had volunteer oats coming up and made a nice inner seed cover crop, so to speak. So. I guess this is a big reason why I switched to May Cabin. I got tired of fighting the weather so much. Uh, we just keep a lot more live calves around, I guess, doing that. Part of with using the cattle too is they don't additionally get on the cover crops, but can uh, utilize the pastures a little better. So with the NRCS and getting some uh, water lines put in and getting tanks placed in the right place to get them some good water. Um, manage the pastures a whole lot better too. This is just one of the setups in one of my pastures. That going out is just where the overflow drain pipe goes so it gets away from the tank area so they don't mud it all up. Uh, Here's a pasture that I divided up. The tank is in the middle there. This is about a 30 acre pasture. Um, split it up in three just with an electric fence. Uh, we had extra rain this year, but um, 
There's mostly kind of a brome grass in here. Uh, I put them out about the 1st of June. I put uh, 18 pair in there and I pulled them off in the middle of October and there's still a little bit of grass left on 30 acres for 18 pair. So I, it shocks me how much a rotational grazing can help if we can get their timing down right to utilize that grass good. Um, here's a soil pit we did. Just uh, that one's just showing uh, how deep some of the roots went with the oats. I think some of those we measured were down a good three foot when we found them. And uh, tried to get close to like a turnip and radish, but it didn't quite work out to see how deep that tap root was actually going. So there's quite a few even at two feet deep. Uh, here's one we did for the Soil Health School. It was at my place last fall. We dug right into the cornfield to see how the um, how deep the roots were going there. They went down pretty deep, but um, I don't know if you can kind of see see the top layer of soil. And there's kind of a light brown, and then the lower stuff, the white, is clay soil. I sure think it's changing that clay over as I'm building organic matter and getting that down. Uh, there's activity happening in, that so in the clay layer that's changing that over. So that top layer is probably, top soil is probably about 10 or 12 inches, probably 10 inches. Next one was about six inches of change, and then that's probably about a four foot pit. There's probably, the rest was heavy clay, I guess I would call it, so. It's, you can change it over time with the, make the roots work like we've been talking today. It does make a difference. Here's a little quote I kind of thought up as we were, uh, doing some work with the ARS lab at Brookings and I just think we got to change how we're thinking here a little bit and we've been having a space program forever we keep looking up at the stars looking for answers I think our answers are right below our feet to keep the next generations going here and I think we can start looking under our feet a little bit we'll find our little pot of gold for us so thank you.